Hey, good morning, guys. It's Wednesday, April 1st. Happy April Fools. Uh, sorry for the delay today. We had our department meeting this morning, so, and then during the meeting, I was looking at the calendar and I was like, oh shoot, I got my days mixed up. I thought the activity was for Friday, but it's actually for today. So um, I know some of you guys, actually you're probably all still sleeping, but some of you might be up already downloading the, uh, the uh, climograph activity, looking at it, be like, what the heck do I need to do? Um, so I'm here to help you out with that, no problem. Um, and uh, I also want to spend a little time just kind of going over the population activity that you guys worked on on a Monday and Tuesday um, and just make sure you kind of understand what's going on there. So uh, let me pull up the activity first um, and we can go over that so that you get some clarity. Um, so here's the activity you worked on on Monday and Tuesday. On Monday, uh, you uh, read through the paragraph here. You answered some of those questions. Um, by the way, sorry about the um, all the crazy formatting and stuff. I don't know. My Word and Adobe, they just were not happy about converting things correctly. So uh, it took many, many attempts, and then I finally figured it out. Uh, anyways, on, the, on Monday, you answered these questions. You did the first graph. And um, what you should have ended up with is a graph that kind of looks like this one here. Um, hopefully you had two lines, uh, one for each animal, one for the snowshoe here, one for the lynx. And uh, if you're looking at this and you're like, what is going on here? Um, well, hopefully you see that there's a relationship between the snowshoe hair and the lynx. And um, before you get too deep into the graph, just something to think about, I'm not gonna try to give you all the answers, is you know, in nature, what is the relationship between hares and lynx, right? Well, hopefully you established that one is a predator and one's the prey. And so um, a question I'd like you to think about, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, is what is, which one controls which, right? In other words, is the snowshoe hare population, if you don't know what a hare is, a rabbit, uh, is the snowshoe hare population controlled by the population of the predator or is the population of the predator controlled by the hare? Um, and that's, uh, that's something I want you to kind of look at and think about. So uh, if you look at the graph here, you can kind of see that there are some correlations. Uh, there's a relationship between the red line and the blue line um, in terms of like what happens when one goes up, what happens to the other, when one goes down, what happens to the other. Uh, and hopefully based on that, you can kind of figure out the relationship. So that was the um, assignment for day two, is you, you had to make this graph, um, let me zoom out a little bit, um, and analyze that and answer some of the questions um, right here in number two. Uh, then yesterday on, on Tuesday, you did another graph, and this one, um, we added humans to the population, uh, or to the equation. In 1903, uh, lynx fur coats started becoming really popular. So the lynx started being hunted, and you can see just by looking at the data table here, we basically wipe out the lynx population, right? Uh, and so the question earlier we talked about was, what is the relationship between the lynx and the rabbit? Which one controls which? And so if you made the graph for this one, you'll find that it looks something like this. Uh, and I know it's really, you can't even really see the blue because it just ends here because they, they drop to a zero. But when the lynx population is taken out, look what happens to the rabbit. And compare this graph to what would happen if the lynx population were still around. Um, now I know it's a little confusing because the uh, the colors got switched. So the, in this case, this picture here, the, the lynx is the red line and the rabbit is the blue line. But in this one, the lynx population is the blue line that you can barely see down there because it basically just stays at zero. And the red line is the rabbit population. You can see that it grows really, really, really quickly. Um, and what we wanted you to uh, write about in terms of the, uh, the CER here, and I, we kind of gave you a, a flow chart to fill in, uh, was to answer the question, um, which is, what are the two factors that control the snowshoe hare population? Uh, and so even though this scenario really only talks about one factor, right, which is the lynx and the impact of the lynx on the rabbit population, another thing I want you to do is kind of think about what we talked about in um, the energy chapters and ask yourself, well, what might be, other, be some other factors that affect uh, whether that hare, that hare population is getting bigger or smaller? And I'll give you a little hint tying it back to evolution uh, and the idea of competition uh, maybe think about that like what are what are certain selection pressures what are aspects of the environment that challenge the hare's ability to survive and why would it lead to a graph that looks like this where you can see it's growing very 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 quickly but at a certain population size at about 2200 or 2300 uh, 
it, it levels out. It doesn't grow anymore. Um, and so you want to be thinking about why that is and then back that up with evidence in your CDR. So that's just a quick overview of uh, what you should have been working on the past couple of days. If you haven't done that, you should definitely uh, get caught up on that. Um, now today we are going to be working on a, another activity. Uh, that's this one right here. Let me drag that over. Um, and this is the, the climograph activity. And um, before we go into the, the how-tos for um, this graph, I just want to take a, a few minutes to give you a little bit of background on climate. Um, because there's, oh, I realize I'm not even on the webcam here. So let me pull myself up here. Um, I realize in just, you know, through the years of teaching and talking to people about climate and climate change, that um, humans have this confusion between climate and weather. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, we wake up day to day, you look outside and you say, what's the weather going to be today, right? You ask your Siri or your Alexa or your Google Home or whatever, what's the weather going to be? And um, we get a set of conditions for that day um, that can be can range from really hot to really cold, from really dry to really rainy or foggy. Uh, and I think just because it changes day to day, like people have it in their head that weather is kind of this random phenomenon that... Um, you know, you just wake up, we don't have any control over it, that it's just whatever it is, is what it is. Uh, and to a certain extent, that's true. But I do want you to understand that um, there's a reason for why the weather is what it is. Um, and when we look at these, these um, patterns of like, what happens with the weather in certain parts of the year or in certain parts of, of the planet, uh, we refer to that as climate, right? Climate is kind of the average uh, of like the individual weather conditions for a particular area. Um, and so I wanna go over like what, what, uh, what contributes to climate because when we talk about climate change, one of the big um, um, uh, criticisms that people have or the way they respond is that climate is this huge thing that humans can't change, um, that it's, it's kind of above and beyond our power and our control. But when you actually get uh, take a closer look at what fuels our climate and weather patterns, um, you'll realize it's actually pretty simple um, and it's also uh, very easy, easily influenced. Uh, so to help you understand that, um, I've got a uh, slideshow that we're going to do real quick. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just the first couple of slides just to um, walk you through a little bit of the background behind why we have the climates that we have. Um, and by the way, if you don't know what Oh, shoot, sorry. Let me get this set up here. Um, if you don't know what the climate is really like about, it comes down to two things. Uh, we're really looking at the temperature and we're looking at precipitation, which you know by now is the amount of water uh, that's coming from the sky, either in the form of rain or snow. So let's do a, a really quick version of this, okay? Um, the biosphere, as you know, is all the parts on the earth where life can be found. And those are really three areas. You have the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. Uh, that's basically your soil, your water, and your air. Okay? Uh, and interactions between all three of these are what create our weather patterns, which then contributes to uh, our climate. Um, and the way that our weather patterns are, are generated is really centered on a really important thing, and that is the sun. Uh, you see, the sun is kind of like the engine that really drives our climate patterns. And the reason for that is because the sun, uh, when, when the rays from the sun, the radiation hits our planet, uh, it heats up our planet, um, obviously, and keeps it nice and warm for us to survive, right? But different parts of the Earth get different amounts of that sunlight. And, uh, and that's what is responsible for creating these different temperature zones. Uh, if you've ever traveled near the equator to South America or parts of Asia, or even just, you know, if you go to the southern states in the, in the U.S., it is a lot, especially in the summertime, it's a lot warmer, it's a lot more humid than you, you're, you're going to find in uh, the northern parts of uh, North America, like in Canada. And the reason for that is because of differences in solar heating, okay? Uh, when the sun's rays hit the hit our planet, uh, it hits our planet in different ways because of the shape of the Earth, right? Because the Earth is curved, uh, it, because it's a, it's a sphere, uh, uh, you can see in this picture that at the equator, you're gonna get a lot more direct sunlight. Okay, which means that the energy from the sun is really, really concentrated in a very small area. Now, because of the angle here, if you were to move um, those sun's rays up further north or further south, because of the angle of the earth, that same amount of light and heat is spread out over a larger surface area, 
right? And so don't be, don't get confused. This bot, this box, orange box here, is a lot bigger, but that's because it's cover, it's the same amount of energy being distributed over a larger surface area, which means that the areas up in Alaska are going to get a lot uh, less heat from the sun. And the result of that, then, as you guys know, is that the middle parts of the Earth along the equator are going to be a lot warmer, uh, and the areas at the poles are going to be a lot cooler. Right now, that's no nothing new, but how does that factor into climate? Well. Um, Oh, and also I should mention there's tilts, tilt of the earth that causes seasons. Um, but what I want to get to is this, uh, because whenever you have um, this difference in heating, okay, um, here's here's a, one way to think about this. If you have, um, let's say your house, um, you know, it's a really cold day outside. And so you turn on the heater and you warm up your house to really hot, like 80 degrees. Right? and you keep all the doors and windows closed. As long as the doors and windows are closed, all the cold air is moving outside. And by the way, if you didn't know, what makes it cold is that the air, the molecules of the air are moving very, very slowly. That's what, mean, what it means for things to have a low temperature, right? There's very little kinetic movement. Uh, inside your house, it's 80 degrees. It's really, really warm. And what uh, the reason for that is because when you heat up air, just like when you heat up water, the molecules are moving a lot faster. So you have this window where on one side, the air is moving really, really fast. On the other side, the air is moving really, really slowly. And that's the difference between the temperatures. Now, if you were to open that window, here's a question, what would happen? Does the heat from the inside move outside or does the cold from the outside move uh, into the hot room? Well, from a temperature perspective, it can be a little bit hard to figure that out, right? Because we know that when you open the door, you start feeling colder, but why do you feel colder? Is it because the cold air is rushing in or is it because the hot air is rushing out? And the answer is, it's the second one. The hot air is moving towards the area that are colder because this, this side's moving really slowly, this side's moving really quickly. So these air molecules are just gonna push their way into the colder areas and that heat is gonna escape, right? Well, that same thing is gonna happen with our planet. If the middle parts are really, really warm, the air molecules there are moving really quickly. Uh, the air molecules up top are moving really slowly, which means that air has a tendency to move from the equator towards the poles. Okay? Uh, and when air moves, what do we call that? That's called wind. So on a windy day, you know, you go out there and, and again, most people, they look at a the wind and they go, wow, today's really windy. That's so random. But it's not really random. The, the wind is generated when you have a big difference between hot and cold. And that temperature gradient, that temperature difference causes air to move more quickly on some days than other. So you can see even from a wind standpoint um, that wind is not a random thing. It's caused by a difference in heating. Um, and again, this is also why there's differences in temperatures. Now, this actually, this phenomenon here is really, really important because as the heated air moves from the equator towards the poles, what it does is it brings warmth to all the areas up here. Uh, in other words, if, the, if that wind right, were to stop, if there were no movement between the, the air in the equator and the air at the poles, then the, the no upper parts of the northern and southern hemispheres would be extremely cold. When air is allowed to circulate, what it brings with it is heat. And that actually warms up um, the air in the northern and southern regions and makes it uh, more hospitable for us. Um, so it's a good thing that the air is moving and, and it's a good thing that we have these wind patterns. Okay, so um, that's kind of a, you know, one, one thing, it just, you know, maybe some more uh, big picture things. Uh, what this ends up creating around our planet are these air patterns, these air currents. And, um, and uh, you can see in this picture here that uh, when you look at, oops, let me zoom in here. When you look at our planet, uh, these, these bot little like circles here, these are called Hadley cells. And I'm not gonna get too much into the detail of this, but what you wanna understand is that heat not only moves towards colder areas, heat also tends to rise where, where cold things tend to sink, right? And this is how hot air balloons work, is you fill up the balloon with hot air, and that air in the balloon is hotter than the air outside the balloon, so the balloon is going to rise. And what that means is that the air above the earth, uh, sorry, the air above the earth at the equator is going to rise more, uh, and the air in the colder areas are going to, that air is going to sink. And so you not only have this movement from north to south, but you also have this movement uh, from the surface of the air uh, of the earth towards space. Um, and so there's this movement that's generated that then creates a circulation. Um, and that circulation of air is what really drives our uh, weather patterns. Uh, when you turn on the news and you, you hear the, 
you know, um, the newscasters talking about high pressure systems, low pressure systems, the meteorologists, and they're going over the weather forecast, uh, it's not random. They can predict what the weather's gonna be based on how these air currents are moving. And so again, you can see from this that uh, weather and climate are not random. They're driven by uh, how different parts of the earth heat up uh, and how some parts cool down. Uh, now, to add a layer to that, here you can see two Hadley cells. Um, one, uh, you know, this is at the equator and this is towards the North and the South Pole. But um, as the air that's really warm rises, what it also does is, you know, warmth also equals more evaporation, right? So um, the air uh, that is rising has a lot of moisture in it. And as that moisture gets into the higher and higher parts of the atmosphere, because of the change in air pressure, um, that water is gonna be released, right? So the evaporated water that turns into clouds is going to um, be, it's gonna condense and we're gonna have precipitation. And that's why uh, on the equator, especially in the rainforest, you see so much rain there because uh, you have so much water that's evaporated, but then as it rises above the equator, right? Cause the heat is rising, the water is also dumped straight down. And that's why these areas tend to be really, really wet. Now, what does that mean for living things? Well, think about it. If you have water, what is gonna grow? Producers. And if you have a lot of producers that make up at the bottom of your food chain, who's gonna survive there? A lot of other organisms, right? Now, that's, the same is not uh, said if you go a little bit north or a little bit south, because by the time the hot air gets up here, it's dropped a lot of that moisture. And so now you have air that is cooling and it's really, really dry. And so that cold, dry air is gonna move a little bit north and because it's cold, it's gonna to start to drop down. Oops, sorry. It's gonna drop down uh, on the areas of the planet that are about 23 to 30 degrees, north or south. Now, if you have dry, cold air dropping down and then being sucked in back towards the, the equator, um, that dry air is going to take more moisture out of the soil, right? And the, re the result of that is the areas in this region tend to be really, really dry. The, the soil is going to be really dry. There's going to be very little rain. And the air actually is pretty cold, especially at night. And what am I describing here? I'm describing deserts, right? So you can see that on above the equator and below the equator, you're going to have these, we're going to expect to see some desert regions um, that even from space you can see are going to be um, really brown, right? Because there's not going to be a lot of water uh, for the plants to grow. Um, and the result of that is the, the food chains and food webs there are going to be pretty minimal compared to the ones in the middle here. So um, zooming out and showing you uh, a picture of our, our planet now, you can see um, this pic this this slideshow is actually about ocean circulation. We'll, we're not really going to cover that, but I do want to show you this picture because if you can see from the view of space, you can see like a band of um, different habitats, right? All the areas along the equator in both South America and in the Congo, in Africa, and through a lot of Southeast Asia, as you go through Malaysia and the Philippines and India, uh, and even parts of New Zealand, it's super green, it's super lush. And the reason for that is because of, um, there, it's getting a lot more sunlight from the, from, uh, the sun. It's getting a lot more um, uh, heat and it's staying nice and warm, which then causes there to be more rain in those areas. But as I said, if you go directly above that green band and below that green band, you're gonna see a lot of dry deserts. And that's why you see in Northern Africa, right, in parts of Egypt and uh, in Algeria and in the Middle East, it's all desert because um, all that moisture has already been dropped on the, the equatorial regions. And we see that in the United States too, is that when you go to Arizona and Texas, it's really, really dry compared to Central America. So. Uh, what do you get out of this? Hopefully what you see is that the way that the biomes are set up on our earth uh, are not random at all. The climate that we see in different areas is not random. And even the day-to-day -day, uh, weather conditions are not random. They are a result of air, of water, of heat being circulated our, in our planet in a very predictable fashion. Um, and, uh, and all of it ultimately is powered by the sun. So the way that the sun's heat and light are, are held by our planet will then dictate uh, the weather patterns. And so when we get to climate change, I want you to remember this because uh, the science behind climate change and, the, and what we call the greenhouse effect is all based on this idea that if we change the amount of heat being captured by the sun, then everything we just talked about here with wind, with rain, with, uh, with the temperatures of both the air and the land and the water, all that can uh, start to be 
affected. Um, and that's kind of the basis of, of what climate change is about. So that's why we're talking about it. Uh, it's, it's really, really important. Um, and there's a whole nother thing going on in the oceans too, but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to AP. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at today's activity. Uh, I'm almost done here with instructions. You're gonna be making a climograph. And what is a climograph? A climograph is a graph that uh, looks at the two aspects of climate, which are temperature and rainfall. And so you can see that on this diagram here, um, uh, we have on the y-axis the average temperature in Celsius, and on the x-axis you have the average rainfall. Okay? So um, below that you have a data table that shows uh, six of the major biomes on our planet. You have the deserts, the temperate grasslands, the tropical rainforest, a temperate forest, and a coniferous forest, uh, and then the tundra. Uh, if you're not sure about the difference between a temperate and a coniferous forest, the temperate forest is the forest where every fall and the winter, most of the trees lose their leaves. So think of the mountains in like the Appalachians uh, on the East Coast. Uh, in the springtime and the summer, they're really, really green, but in the wintertime, all the leaves have fallen and they're basically just bare skeletons of trees. Uh, coniferous forests, on the other hand, are also known as evergreen forests. These are where you find pines and redwoods and sequoias, uh, Douglas firs, um, kind of like your Christmas tree looking trees, uh, where they keep their needles all year round. Okay, so that's the difference between temperate and coniferous forests. And if you're wondering like, well, what's the difference or why, why would some of them lose their leaves and why would some of them keep them? Well, take a look at the data with the temperature and the rainfall and you'll kind of get some hints about that. Uh, finally, the tundra, if you've never heard of it before, that's the areas in the, in the far north uh, that it's so cold that the soil is actually kind of froze, uh, frozen. It's called permafrost. And, uh, and so as you would expect, it's pretty cold there and uh, that's gonna limit what can grow. So what you're gonna do is, um, I know this looks like a lot of graphing and it's gonna take a little time, but it's pretty easy, it's pretty mindless, is you're gonna start with one biome. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through the desert here and I don't know, know if it lets me, let me see if I can draw. Will it let me draw in here? I don't know. I don't think so. I know there, oh, here we go. Okay, so I've got a little highlighter here um, or a pen. Maybe it'll let me. Oh, I don't want to make a signature. Sorry. Okay, we'll just use the highlighter. So here we have the desert and, um, and, oh my gosh, I highlighted everything. Not what I wanted. Dang you. Okay. Anyways, um, we'll start with the desert. What you're gonna do is for every month, you're gonna take a look at their temperature and how much precipitation they have. You're gonna graph that by putting a single data point. So in January, it's seven degrees Celsius, 25 millimeters of rain. So you're gonna go to uh, let's do Celsius first, uh, seven, which is gonna be about here, and then rain is gonna be about 25, which is this line right here. So you're gonna put a data point right there. Um, I wonder if it will let me draw. Oh, there you go. Okay, I put a data point. Um, the next one, February, you have a temperature of 10, rainfall of 20. So it means it's gonna be 10, and then when I come back a little bit for 20, I'm gonna put a data point there, okay? Uh, in March, it's gonna be at 11, at 22. Again, still pretty close, okay? A little bit higher, so we'll, we'll draw an old dot again. So you can see what we're gonna end up doing with the desert, okay? And you guys, if you know anything about desert, it doesn't get a lot of rainfall, and the temperatures here are gonna stay uh, relatively warm. So what we're gonna end up with are a bunch of data points that fall into this area, okay? And what you're gonna do is once you've graphed all 12 months, you're gonna take that one color, in this case I'm using yellow, and I'm gonna draw a circle around all these data points, and this circle here is gonna represent the desert, okay? And then you're gonna pick a different color, and I don't know if they'll let me choose a different highlighter color here. It doesn't look like it. But imagine that I, you know, switch to a orange or a green for the rain, for the temperate grassland. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna plug, plug in the points, all right? And I'm just making these up. And these points might be more or less spread out depending on what environment you're in. And once you've pl plotted out those 12 points, then again, you're gonna draw a circle around them. And that blob is now gonna represent the grassland. Um, so you're gonna do this with all of them. There are gonna be overlaps. So sometimes you're gonna have a blob that's gonna overlap like this. Um, that's why we're going to use different colors so you can see it. And at the end, what you're going to have is an image that kind of shows you the distribution of both heat and rainfall uh, uh, across the, the six major biomes on our planet. Um, so that's how you would go about doing this graph. When you're done with that, then you're going to answer some really basic questions here for the data analysis just to uh, see if you can interpret your, your graph. And then the main thing is to uh, write your CER. 
Um, and so for this one, the CER is actually asking an important question. It's asking, what is the relationship between climate and biodiversity, right? So now that you understand what climate is uh, and what contributes to it, how is it related to biodiversity? So over here, I've given you some numbers of how many plant species and animal species are found in these different biomes. And you can see, as you would expect, some of them like the desert have very few species and some like the rainforest have a lot of species, right? Um, also look at the relationship between the plant species and the animal species. So looking at this data set, what you wanna do is figure out what's the relationship between climate and biodiversity. And you're gonna do a CER. Um, I've given you this little graphic organizer to write your claim, find three pieces of evidence. Um, what should your evidence look like? What I would do is uh, look at you know a certain biome, for example, the desert, and say, okay, the desert obviously has very little biodiversity. There aren't that many animal species. There aren't that many plant species. And when I go to my graph here, I'm also going to notice that the desert has a certain uh, certain parameters for their their climate. Uh, what I want to do is relate the amount of sunlight or the amount of heat and the amount of water they're getting to the number of species we find here. Okay, and even within this, you want to be able to kind of relate the number of uh, of plant species, okay, to the number of animal species. Um, so there's th that would count as one piece of evidence, okay, is that you have the climate affecting the plants, which then affects the animals in one particular biome, that's gonna be one piece of evidence. So you're basically gonna pick three biomes to be your three pieces of evidence, and then tie them together with your reasoning to support your claim. Uh, so once you filled out your, uh, your chart here, then on the next available page, you're gonna go ahead and write a CER paragraph. And I did give you guys a rubric here so that you kind of know what we're looking for. You wanna be in the solid column where you get your threes for your claim, your evidence, and your reasoning. Okay, so that is your activity for today. Um, I know this uh, may be a little bit more than what you're used to. So, uh, you know, we did a lot of lectures last week. And so this week is more about like kind of doing the activities. You didn't really do too much last week filling in blanks. So um, you can start this today. And then if you need more time, maybe do one part of it today. And then maybe tomorrow on Thursday, I'm not really assigning anything. We have a live stream. So, you know, you, if you have any questions, you can ask, ask me for help. Uh, and then I'll go over, you know, uh, I'll go over some of this with you. Uh, but then maybe tomorrow you can write your CER. And then on Friday, just so you know what's coming, it's the day before spring break, technically, we are going to have a little quiz just to kind of uh, review all the stuff that we've talked about the past two weeks. So uh, you'll be looking for that. I will probably make the quiz live uh, maybe midnight, um, you know, uh, I guess Thursday night. And then you'll have all day Friday. And I'm actually going to give you into Saturday, too, to take it. Uh, although technically it's spring break. So, you know, if you want to feel like you're all done, you're going to want to finish up all that stuff by Friday. Okay. And then for sure, obviously don't take that quiz until you've done these activities and watch the PowerPoints and fill out the worksheets because the quiz is going to be based on all that. Okay. So uh, I hope that's helpful. And um, if you have any questions, uh, just, you know, post a comment below or shoot me an email. All right. Have a great day. I'll see you later.